My name is Pierre Caesa. Um, I'm responsible for partnerships for Google Arts and Culture in Asia. Welcome to the Puban Forum. I'm delighted to speak to you all. Uh, we're going to spend about 30 minutes together. Um, I want to tell you about what Google Arts and Culture uh, has been doing to give access to arts and to culture to everyone online for the past few years. Um, I'm speaking to you here from Paris, um, so very happy to, to talk to you. Um, Paris, where we have our engineering team. And what I'm about to tell you today is how do we work with them? What do we want to do? What do we want to achieve? Um, so let me take you through a quick presentation uh, for the next 30 minutes. I hope you will enjoy it. I hope you will learn something and hopefully it will maybe spark some ideas and uh, hopefully you will contact us uh, so we can start a beautiful project together. So let me get started, please, um, with this really quick video that is an introduction about what is Google Arts and Culture. You might not know much about this project, uh, but Google has been investing uh, for the cultural sector for over 10 years. And this is a really short summary of who we are and what we do. Let's have a look now. So let me start by telling you what can you find if you download Google Arts and Culture on your smartphone right now. Well, you can find, as I mentioned to you, a lot of things. Van Gogh bedroom, but also gastronomy from Spain, Forbidden City in China, Orsay Museum in France, a lot of things, right? And that represents about 2,000 museums across 80 countries. The objective of this project is really straightforward. We started Google Arts and Culture back in 2011, almost 10 years, at a time where there was not much for culture and for the arts online. And what we wanted is to find a place where every curator, every historian, every content cultural expert could share his voice, could share his stories. So we built this project with one mission, which is still the same today, which is to make the world's culture accessible to anyone for free. I like to say that we are just getting started on this very important uh, journey. Um, why? Because when you think about it, we started in 2011 with only 17 pilot institutions. Those were the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Uffizi in Italy, and, and some others. But now we actually work with a lot of different types of organizations, right? And if you Google, if you go on Google Arts and Culture, you will be able to uh, discover over 7 million artifacts. 7 million is a big number, right? Um, but it doesn't matter much. What really matters here is what curators are doing with this number. Because they are the one curating stories out of those 7 million artifacts. They are the one making sense of some complex cultural artifacts, some archaeological items. 
some maybe animals that can be found in natural sciences museum. And they are the one bringing those immersive stories. Why immersive? Because we built a tool for each curator to be able to get like users deep diving in such beautiful stories. This is just an overview of a few institutions that we work with. So there is a lot uh, of uh, different type of partners we work with. Now that you see who we work with and who we partner with uh, on the non-for-profit uh, manner, because we are a non-commercial -co non uh, entity inside Google, um, now that you know what kind of organization we work with, I want to tell you maybe more about what do we do on a daily basis. What is our work? I'm going to maybe just give you a couple of examples of the technology we develop. But the intent here is that all of this technology can be useful for the cultural ecosystem, that they can help them both preserve their stories, their heritage, their artifacts, and also share it with a wider audience. The first technology um, that is not visible, it's more like a behind the thing uh, thing. It's a content management, management system that allow any institution to host their collection on an unlimited uh, manner uh, on our um, CMS. So that's a very straightforward way for any institution. Why? Because I give you a couple of big names of museums, right? But we also work with much smaller groups, for instance, the Street Arts Foundation. Um, and sometimes those small institutions are made of one or two individuals who have really limited sources and sometimes not even expertise on technology. So we thought about those tools as a way for everyone to be able to, to use them. So if you join Google Arts and Culture and that you will start to put your hands on the system, you will see that it's really simple. It's a lot of drag and drop. We made it as simple as we could. But the question is, now that you want to digitize your collection, well, what can you do? Well, maybe your institution already has images, digitized images of that collection, in which case you can bring it on CMS. But we also build some special technology that allow you to digitize artworks in a new way. So this is the art camera that you can see on this presentation now. The art camera is a Google-built camera. Uh, it's roboticized, which means that if you just plug this camera, which is quite high, it's like almost my size, uh, a little less than two meter, um, and if you plug it to the software to the laptop, um, you'll see the camera moving from X to Y, being able to digitize each little part of the artwork, taking thousands, thousands of images, and then rebuilding it as one pyramid of files that will allow you to zoom into infinite details. What does that mean is you will be able to see and zoom into what your naked eye could not see. I always like to take an example, and I will invite everyone in this room to check. Um, I'm a personal fan of Peter Bruegel the Elder, which is a, a Flemish painter, a Flemish painter from the region where I was born in the north of France. And this painter is to me super important for various reasons. Uh, of course, he's one of the leading uh, uh, artists of the Flemish Renaissance. But what I find interesting with this painter is his capacity to hide sometimes very, very small details on the background of his paintings, sometimes for political reasons, sometimes for artistic uh, purposes. Um, and I will invite you to have a look at a painting uh, from the Metropolitan Collection in New York. And the name of this artwork is The Harvester. So have a look on Google Arts and Culture and start to zoom, zoom, and zoom, and you will be able to see unbelievable details, like, for instance, monks 
having a bath, not really dressed in a lake. You have to zoom a lot because it's really hidden. So this is what the art camera can allow you to do, is to find things that you could not even think about because they are too small. Think about the capacity of those technologies also for textile or for any type of, of artwork. It really brings you a new perspective. It really gets to see things that you could not think about. And what I like about it is that it allows also curators to tell new type of stories about collections. For now, we have digitized over 12,000 masterpieces with this technology, but it's still going on, still going on. Of course, you can also find, and I'm sure that many people in this room are fans uh, of Louis Chan. Um, well, five of these masterpieces are also accessible in super high resolution. So I invite you to have a look because it's, it's quite, quite impressive. This is another technology that we give away also to our partner museum. It's called Street View and you all know it. And we adapted the technology uh, for indoor captures inside museums. So it helps curators to actually contextualize the artwork in a scenography. Um, so here you can actually see a penguin walking by. Well, it's uh, a little feature that we added um, a few months back, uh, thinking that it would maybe create excitement for kids. And it actually does. So we are uh, actually happy to see the engagement that those small, simple, and fun, playful ideas uh, can also generate. Um, and the idea of those Street View tools is that you can actually turn them into a kind of audio guide for your museum, which means if you had some voice over, you can take people inside a virtual tour inside institutions. So I told you that if you do download the app, Google Arts and Culture, which is available on every store. <clears throat> well, I told you you could find more than 7 million artifacts, but what can you do with those artifacts? That's where the connection between arts and technology together can really create new things. Let me give you an example. What you see on the left side of the screen is uh, a visualization of an, uh, a feature of the app that I really love, which is called Art Selfie. Art Selfie is powered by AI. And if you take a picture of yourself, I'm going to do it right now, actually, and see what it, what it gets us. Um, if you take a snap a selfie of yourself, it will match your own face with a portrait among all the museums in the world that have been uploading portraits. So it's quite impressive because you can find the doppelganger of yourself hidden somewhere in the museum. And sometimes, I mean, it's very surprising. I'm, I said I will do it, so let me snap a selfie. And let's see what it gets us. Well, I hope you can actually see it. If you can't, well, have a look for yourself. Try to snap a selfie and let me know what it gets you. Um, I just remember a beautiful story of a, a woman who actually took a selfie of herself and matched with her actual own grandmother. The portrait was in a museum in the US uh, and she knew her mother has been painted by someone, but she didn't know about this painting. So these are this type of story that we think technology plus art can create together. Um, another one that I really like is called Art Projector. Uh, you can do it too right now on your phone while you're listening. You can just like stop listening to me for a few minutes and just try it. It's called Art Projector. It's also accessible on the app. Uh, there is a little camera button down the app. Click on it. You will see a menu of different things. Art Selfie, Art Projector. Art Projector will allow you to actually display an artwork on your living room. Like right now, right here, you can actually see Mona Lisa, you can actually see Starry Night from Van Gogh and all the artworks you love on your own living room. And it's fun, but it's also important because specifically in a time of uh, sanitary crisis where, we, where it's getting harder for people to get out of their homes, uh, we now have also a capacity to understand that 
what is the size of an artwork because it matters for an artist. The reason why um, Bruegel the Elder painted the Yawning Man on such a tiny piece of wood uh, is a very important uh, way for him to express his art. So size, of course, is an important element to understand um, the, 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 the project of the artist. So that will allow you to get ratio and proportions. Two other features that you can find now on the app that I really love. Uh, I will start by um, Art Transfer. Art Transfer uh, is also powered by Google AI and TensorFlow technologies. And it will basically transform any picture you take on your phone with popular styles. What popular styles means is, is some very, very famous artwork. So if you take a, a, a picture, for instance, of, I don't know, um, your guitar, uh, you can add a layer of a beautiful artwork, like the wave, the great wave from Okusai, or maybe a Andy Warhol painting on top of it. And then you can start to become creative yourself, thanks to the art history. Uh, so this is something quite exciting that I invite everyone to do as well. Another one that I wanted to mention to you is Pocket Gallery. Pocket Gallery to me is probably my favorite feature. Why is because it allows any museum to build a physical extension, but a digital one, right? It's like you could build some new walls in your institutions in a way because it allows you to create virtually something that is, wouldn't be possible in, in the physical world. Um, so now if you click on, for instance, Meet Vermeer, which is one of the exhibitions you can find, or maybe the Gallery of Colors, you will be able to retrieve all Vermeer paintings in one physical place, digital, right? Um, although Vermeer paintings, as you know, are disseminated across the world in many different museums and many different countries. And now we have a way to actually put them back in one place. The way it works is you just like take your phone, put the gallery on your table, on the ground, and just with your phone, walk inside it. And it's just like a, a walk through in the digital gallery. Uh, so those are ways also, I think, which are quite interesting to understand how technology can put its tools at the service of getting arts and culture accessible to everyone. I mentioned to you that I want to pose and take you through a quick tour of the lab in Paris. Um, the lab in Paris is a very special place. It's a place where curators, museum directors, artists, creative coders, engineers, all those creative minds meet together to imagine what would be next. Um, and out of this lab, which is our research and development space in Paris, we meet those people, make those people meet and think with them, all right, what is next? What you see here is a few uh, preview of some project you can actually now try yourself online on our experiments page. So if you go on Google Arts and Culture, there is a section in the menu called experiments. And there are some experimentation with colors. There are some experimentation with drawings. If you start to draw, for instance, let's say a triangle, it will match it thanks to AI to a painting that contains a triangle, and sometimes it can be very surprising. So all those experiments are accessible for free as well online. This is one that I really enjoyed um, seeing being created. It's called TSNE Map. TSNE is the name of an algorithm that basically allows you to organize uh, visual elements into a 3D virtual landscape. And what you see on the right side of the screen uh, is actually millions of artwork organized as an ocean, uh, a sea of art, which allow you to take your virtual ship and navigate inside it and start to realize that it's not any random uh, virtual landscape. But as you can see, it's organized by colors and by other uh, features. 
So you start to zoom, let's say, on a specific place and start to understand, oh, but this is only portraits. And then you can move to places to places and find out that, well, the arts of the world can be also organized in a different way than put on walls inside museums. They can be gathered also as visual similarities uh, and it brings you a new perspective on how can you discover art. This is another project that I really uh, enjoyed uh, seeing coming to life with the Chauvet Cave in France, which is one of the oldest um, art cave you can find in the world. Um, it's, a, it's a really amazing place. Um, and we thought that considering this place is not open to the public, it's really fragile. I mean, you, you can barely see people coming in because it's too fragile. Um, and we thought with the partner, why don't we find a way that people could walk virtually inside this place because it bears like so much important uh, arts um, elements. So we actually created a 3D model of this cave and made it accessible through augmented reality. So if you just Google now uh, on, your, on the browser Chauvet Cave, you will see on the screen, first result, um, discover in 3D. So I invite you to just click on this. Take your phone and actually start to walk on the Chauvet Cave in France. This is something you can do directly from Google search. This is an, another project I wanted to briefly tell you about because these are projects that I really enjoy because they bring together institutions from across the world. Uh, here we wanted to pay tribute with our partners to mankind's greatest capacity, uh, which is inventing and discovering. So we call this project Once Upon a Try. We launched it last year with more than 100 institutions, including NASA, CERN, Smithsonian, and so many more, Sichuan Museum in China, and many, many other great institutions across the world. Um, and what we wanted to do is to identify inventors, um, but those great minds, those great inventors are worth discovering. They have background stories you can even think about. And I really invite you to discover this project and discover so many thousands of crazy ideas that came to life for the past century. We also celebrated uh, with our partner museum International Museum Day, which is a really important momentum for the cultural ecosystem uh, each year, of course. Um, and we always try to uh, celebrate those moments with our institution by creating social campaign and make, making sure that uh, every country can have a voice uh, to actually share its stories to a global audience. Um, I just wanted to pause for one second on, on this project that we launched recently um, in Indonesia. It's a project that is very uh, I mean, it's marvelous because I didn't know much about shadow puppets, why young shadow puppets in Indonesia. Uh, and I learned a lot. I really learned a lot. And that's what those projects meant to me. They meant to open your eyes to new forms of art, to open also your ideas to new cultures. Um, and here, what we wanted to do is to uh, bring digitization of uh, the most beautiful Wayang, including uh, puppets that belong to the king and, and, and very precious uh, artifacts like that and explain where does that come from and what is the current um, play in Indonesia with those puppets. Um, so all of this is available online. As you can see, it's not only about fine arts, it's also about more popular arts uh, and you can discover that online right now. Time is running by, so uh, I'm gonna soon uh, end up this session with you. Uh, but I wanted to maybe just tell you a little last something. Um, we've seen since the months of March, um, of course, 
a very complex time for cultural organizations. Uh, and we also have seen something that I personally moved me, which is so much creativity across all cultural institutions that I'm talking with every day. In Southeast Asia, in China, in Taiwan, in France, all over the world, we've seen people getting so many new ideas about how can they engage with their audience online. Now that museums cannot be as open as they used to be, what can we find in terms of ideas and tools to connect with the people that are staying home. And we kind of observed that and we thought, wow, there is so much going on right now that we just wanted to bring together those ideas, whether it might be institution finding new ways to live stream uh, events, like a Scala concert at home, in Milano, Italy, or might be museum having new ideas to share, beautiful story about um, their collection on social networks. There are so much, there is so much happening. So this presentation that is called Connected to Culture, we built it as a toolkit and I would say as, as a resource also for any institution to pick the best practices, the best ideas that we found across the world in order to maybe spark new ideas and find maybe new ways to also engage uh, with, with new audiences. Well, that's it for me. Uh, I really want to thank you very deeply uh, and very sincerely for the time you, um, you gave me. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the Fuban Forum. And I would like to thank you again uh, to, to the Food and Forum for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a, it's a great, great opportunity I had, and I'm very grateful for that. I hope to see you, everyone, very soon. Thank you.